it's good to worship together, isn't it? I said it's good to worship together, isn't it? <laughs> and I know you've all been worshiping him all week long, but there's something about coming together in unity when we sing the name, the name above every other name. Amen. The name above every circumstance, the name above every situation, the name above every relationship, the name above every trouble. Amen? I think for me personally, when we spend this time in worship, it just brings back the remembrance of how much he loves us, how much he's been with us all week long. It's empowering. <coughs> Turn in your Bibles to chapter 24 of the book of Genesis. I was thinking about 66 books in the Bible, but if there was only one that almost touches on every single life situation, the book of Genesis has it. The book of Genesis has a lot of answers in it. We're going to really dig through chapter 24, but before I begin, Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for using my lips to speak your word. And I thank you for the ears here that are here to hear and that the word would go down deep and help roots grow deeper than they already are. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were here last week, Tim did a really good job on getting us focused on what is the will. What is your will, Lord? The will of God. You don't have to raise your hand because I don't want to point anybody out. But if you were like me, I went through just looking for the will of God in almost everything I read this week. And it, it was highlighted and some of it was not so much. But there is a lot of the will of God in Scripture. So many that I wanted to s remind you of some. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, our sanctification, the thing we talk about the most, we may not use that word, but the process, I'm in a process. The process is the will of God. Hebrews 12, no, 1036. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Well, there's a lot packed right in there. I could preach on that whole, just that scripture. We need endurance so that we would do the will of God so that we receive the promise. Who wants the promise? Everybody, good. So I'm going to piggyback on Tim's message And hopefully this will stir you up some more to stay in his will. All right, Genesis chapter 24. We're going to read most of it, I'm gonna, but I'm going to do it in chunks, okay? So I'm going to read um, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read out of the New American Standard Version. I actually have the Jewish... Bible version on my in my notes, but as I was reading it this morning, I thought that's going to be so different than what your what you have in your lap. <laughs> so we'll do the New American Standard. Verse one. Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant the oldest of his household, who was in charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, 
and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take your son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and who swore to me saying to your descendants, I will give this land. He will send his angel ahead of you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free of this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore to him concerning this matter. So what's happening here? Abraham is described as the father of all nations, and he chooses a key servant, Eliezer. It doesn't say Eliezer in the New American Standard Version. It might in yours. It did in my Jewish Bible. But he, his key servant here is Eliezer. He is t Abraham is t asking Eliezer to go back and get his son a wife. Go back to his relative's land, not the land he lives in. Eliezer means mighty divine helper. So the father of all nations gets the mighty divine helper to go find a bride for his son. As I continue on, I want you to remember the word Eliezer, divine helper, is a type or a shadow of what we now know as the Holy Spirit. Because we are on the other side of the cross, the Holy Spirit is our divine helper. Prior to the cross, they had to use people that the Lord assigned. The Lord told Abraham to have his mighty divine helper, his most press, well, I guess, confident servant to go do this for him. So what is the Holy Spirit's job? What was the job of Eleazar? It was to call the bride unto the son and to prepare the bride for the son. You understand that we all are considered the bride of Christ, male and female. It's non-gender. When you become saved, when you be say, yes, I want to be under your lordship, you are a bride. The Holy Spirit is to call us to the Son. The Holy Spirit's job is to prepare us to be the bride. It says in the word that the Holy Spirit does not testify of himself. It doesn't boast in himself. He teaches us all things about Jesus. He testifies of Jesus. So Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit because he is the most trusted servant whom the Father sends to find the bride for his son. What I find interesting about this passage is that the father gives explicit instructions that if the bride is not willing to follow after the son, don't bring the son there. And sometimes we try to do that as Christians. I know I have. 
We try to take our relationship with Jesus sometimes and mold it or make it fit our form of Christianity. We want Jesus to come with us rather than us follow him, right? Each and every one of us is tempted at times to make the cross of Christ to fit our pattern. We think that God should be a formula or maybe a blessing machine where if we line everything up right, then we should be able to dictate to God what he should do. But the Father here explicitly warns the, the, the servant and says, no, 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 don't take the son there. If the bride was not prepared or the bride was not willing to follow, don't go there. So I know you're all spinning. I mean, I, as I was writing this and and hearing from the Lord, he showed me that in the beginning of James's um, sickness, I tried to put him in my pattern. I tried to dictate if I did something right, if I did it this way, if I put things in this order, it would all turn out the way I wanted it. We can't put the cross into a pattern that we designed. It only can be in the way he designed it. So it will only work one way. So we get saved and God pulls us out of a pit of darkness and we want to follow, but all of a sudden we find we want Christ to follow us, adjust to our lifestyle rather than making our life fit him. It's probably the number one reason why, don't know what the statistics are, but when you, w you all know of someone who got a revelation, an encounter, maybe made the declaration, Jesus, I want to, you to be my Lord and Savior, and shortly thereafter, what happens? That commitment wanes, that commitment goes to the wayside, that commitment falls. Because it's hard. You want it to go your way. You want that Savior to fit into your lifestyle. Your lifestyle has to change. <laughs> right? So what happens here is that Eliezer... The trusted servant, the mighty divine helper, is charged with finding a wife for the son, and he comes out, and he's challenged. The son, by the way, Abraham's son, Isaac, is who he's looking, appointed to look for the wife. And Eliezer wanted to know how he would know who the bride is for the son. Eliezer prayed a prayer, and he cried out to God for a sign that would show him who the bride is. So in verse 10, continuing on, and then the servant took 10 camels from the camels of his master and went out with a variety of good things of his masters in his hand. So he set out and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor, he made the camels kneel down outside the city of the well of water when it was evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, Lord, God of my master, Abraham, please grant me success today and show kindness to my master, Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the young women to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant, Isaac. 
and by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So he's, he's looking for a sign, he's, but he's asking the Lord for the sign, right? The, lo the servant looks for a sign of confirmation upon the bride. And the servant wants the father to confirm the bride for him. And Jesus said, if you've seen the son, you've seen the father. And so he's charged with finding the right bride for the son. We must love and grow in love with God in order to be that bride. Remember when the Pharisees asked Jesus, what is it? What's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's from Luke's version, 1027. That right there is another key to what is the will of God. Love the Lord your God. His will for us is to love him. Church, we aren't equipped to love other people until we love God first. We aren't equipped to love other people until we learn to love God first. And in order to love God, you have to understand how much he loves you. Every single one of us at, a t at some point struggles with a neighbor. And I'm not talking literally neighbor. But you struggle with loving someone. This is the burden on the church right now. Many of you may be unaware, maybe you are aware. The church is under fire. Big churches, big names, men of God that we have read their teachings, we have come in agreement with their teachings, they are standing on the word as far as we know, they're falling. Men of God are falling, men and women. By the grace of God, let it not be us. By the grace of God, let it not be us. the grace of God, let it not be us. So when I searched my heart and said, Lord, show me, where do you begin? Where do we begin to make sure my foundation is sure and that I don't come under the enemy's demise to be a false teacher, to be an imposter, to, to hide anything? And you know what? He brought me to this scripture, love me. Love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm convicted right now. There's people in this room, in this body, who don't love each other, who don't love your spouse, who don't love your neighbor, who are critical of people you don't even know. This is going against his word, his will. And the endurance is not there to go to the promised land. We are in trouble. You and I are in trouble unless we get this in alignment. Now, I'm only responsible for myself. My job as a shepherd is to steer you in the right direction, to come and get you when I see you get out of the pasture. And I hope I can do that. I pray I can do that. But it starts with you surrendering and you being willing and you loving me and you loving who's sitting next to you and you loving who's out there out there, we have to love. But if you don't know how much God loves you, that you can receive his love and love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, 
then you're just playing a game. You're just playing a game. You're not going to grow deep. We're not going to weather the shaking. The storm is here. This is a wake up, right? Amen. But we really aren't equipped to love anyone, be it our neighbor or our spouse, unless we learn to love ourselves. And we can't really learn to love ourselves until we get a fresh revelation of how much God loves us. His will was to create us for love, to love him, to, and to have relationship. The air in here is palatable. Someone tell me this is good, this is not good, you're... You, you got to stop this, Cindy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so Eliezer, he journeys with his master's camels as well as many goods from the master. And as he travels, he knew that as he approached the well, there might be some people there. Would one of them be the bride for his master's son? And scripture goes on to tell us that when he approaches Nahor, he made his camels kneel down outside the city of, by the well of water at evening. And that's the time when women go, would go out to draw water. Apparently, in, it was custom that la the ladies would approach the well in the evening. Women drew water at night after the men and the workers had opportunities to draw their water first. A lady named Rebecca approaches the well with her maid servant, and they come to draw water. It's interesting that Rebecca would be the one indeed that the father had chosen for the son. And as the servant Eliezer, the mighty divine helper, had prayed that he would find the right bride. I believe the Holy Spirit is doing this today for us. I believe that when we become born again, the Holy Spirit groans and intercedes for us according to Romans 8.26. It says that he intercedes for us with groaning and uttering that we know not of. That's the Holy Spirit's groaning to purify the bride. So continuing on in verse 13, Actually, 15. And it came about before he had finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had had relations with her. She went down to the spring and filled the jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me drink a little water from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. Then she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will also draw water for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all of his camels. And meanwhile, the man watching, the man was taking a close look at her in silence to find out whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. In other words, is she the one? And isn't that the way the Holy Spirit does with us? We're at a moment of decision, and someone has preached a good message. Not me. <laughs> Maybe we don't know the word, and we wonder, is the message real? 
is this message real? Is the gospel for real? Is this sign real? Is this what you've led me to, Lord? These are all the questions. And at times, the Holy Spirit remains silent. The divine helper is silent. Why? Because he won't interfere with our will. Boy, I wish he would. <laughs> I really wish he would, but he won't. Such a good father. Yes, God has chosen us, just as he told Moses that the children of Israel were chosen. But it's a question of us accepting him. It's a question of acceptance because God is pleased when we make our free will choice on our own. It's in the quiet time of the Holy Spirit, the servant waiting upon the confirmation of his bride, that it's up to us to make the decision to serve or not. It's in that, Tori Lynn would call it the squeaky space. And I'm sure I've said this before, we just rush around too much. We're just rushing. We live in a day and age where everything is on a schedule, and if you don't get this thing done because the next thing is, is coming, it's a constant, 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 constant. We're constantly looking at our watch. Do we, do, are, we, are we where we should be? How much time do we have left? It's constant. But the Holy Spirit is slow, quiet. Be still and know that I am God. It's a disciplined life to be in a constant mode of moving because we can't change the way the world is. We can't change that there is a system of time and we only have 24 hours in a day, but we can slow down our spirit man and let him remind us, nudge us for any confirmation that we need. Love. Love is not a fast, rushed, pressed upon, aggressive verb. Love is slow. I think when we get in alignment the way God loves and how we are to love in return, many of our our circumstances, our situations, our things that keep us awake at night, things that cause us anxiety, all of those things will just slowly fall away. We're just out of order. And the enemy's plan and plot is to get us out of order. It's to shake us till we don't look at who created us and why. It's to take us away from the will of God. If it sounds so simple, why isn't it? Why isn't it? Because he is so sovereign, he doesn't want to fight with our will. So it's a disciplining of our will. Your human will has to be disciplined. The best way to do that is to get in his word. I'm feeling a little disciplined right now. How about you? <laughs> if the, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword and penetrates to the dividing of our soul and our spirit, it's our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions that are in constant battle with our spirit. Our spirit wants to be king. 
He breathed the, his spirit into us to, be, to, to equip us. So if we are, when we read the living and active double-edged sword, when you hear it on Sundays, you read it on your own time, you hear it on a message you're listening to, it should change you. It should align your soul to come under the control of your spirit. If it's not, I challenge you that you're not really listening. The word needs to be ingested. Think about when you eat too fast and you don't taste you don't taste the substance that you're eating. You don't get the flavors. You don't enjoy it. Why did you even eat? <laughs> right? So I challenge you this week, and I hope to hear testimonies. The word, when you read it, when you listen to it, when you even in conversations, when we share, when we have times of relationship and we're talking about the word with one another it is living and active and it should help you divide what your soul has been trying to wrestle with your spirit and the spirit has to come up and be king and over the situation and when the word is applied it has to do that so ask yourself what happened what has changed for me because of this word i just read or heard I guarantee there's something in every single message for everybody. All, it has, all you need is one thing, one thing to turn that gear. But you've got to listen. You've got to ingest it. You've got to take time to chew on it, to get the flavor. What flavor is it? What part of your life is it to affect? It's the only way we're going to grow. Ideally, I think every Sunday, everyone coming in here should be a little bit different, a little bit better. If his will is working in our lives, wouldn't that happen? His sanctification is happening on a daily basis. Amen. So as he waited, Eli Eliezer realized that the journey was prosperous. And so when the camels had finished drinking and he took a gold he took a golden nose ring weighing a half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels of gold and he offered them to her. It's interesting the symbols that God uses. The servant presents gifts from the father to confirm this is the bride. So what does that look like today? I'm proposing that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are our confirmation of God's blessing on us as his bride. The gifts of the Holy Spirit come from the Comforter, the mighty divine helper of the Father. That we receive those as gifts because he's saying, yes, this is a bride willing. This is a bride that is befitting of having these gifts. Yet the gifts are not enough. The gifts must be added and only made aware of that the gifts testify of Jesus. Even if we pray for someone and they're healed, which that happened this morning, it's not us. We can't get too puffed up about the gifts moving, re moving in our lives unless we 
attach them to the giver of the gifts. Even if we pray a prayer of deliverance and we see a massive release, it's not us. It's the, the creator of those gifts, the giver of the gifts. But he is saying, I have these gifts to confirm to you, you are the bride. The reason the servant gave the gifts is, was to confirm to the bride. God gives us gifts so that the world and others may know we are different, that we are the bride. So it's a shame if we hide the gifts. It's, it's a shame on churches that don't recognize the gifts and allow them to be activated. But there's a proper way. There's an order. All right, continuing on, verse 22. And when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels in gold, and he said, whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room for us to stay overnight at your father's house? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Beth Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Nahor. Again she said to him, we have plenty of both straw and feed and room to stay overnight. And then the man bowed low and worship the Lord in verse 27 and he said blessed be the Lord the God of my master Abraham who has not abandoned his kindness and his trustworthiness toward my master as for me the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers as soon as he recognized that that was the confirmation, that that she would be the bride he would bring back for Isaac. He did what? Bowed and worshipped the Lord. It's something we don't do enough of. We don't give him thanks in the moments. We might do it later, which still is fine, but it's in those moments, day by day, moment by moment. Marcia recognized there was a a, 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 a very electrical connection when she realized the, reading the report, getting the video from Megan, because I'm sure her heart, when she read the report from Daniel, when I read it, I went into immediate prayer. Because I knew it was in the city that, that they were in. You don't know. First thing that came to our minds was that probably it could have been one of them. So then she went to praying, she did communion, and then got the answer. And I bet you thanked him. We need to have a, a grad, you know, that was part of Tim's message. His will is for us to be constantly thankful, to bring thanksgiving in everything. That's part of his will for us. I'm gonna, th this is a great chapter. We're going to skip or move ahead to verse 52. So the servant bows down and literally is thanking God. You gave me confirmation. You have blessed me. Of course, as a servant, wouldn't you think he wants to do his duty and what Abraham had asked him to do? He doesn't want to come back with nothing, right? So he's thankful. So they're, they're actually on the property of Laban, which is Abraham's, I think it's Abraham's brother. So verse 52, or 50, I'll start at 50. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, the matter has come from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Before you, Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, 
as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servants heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. And the servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And then he and the men who were with him in our, and drank and spent the night. And when they got up in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Now here, listen to this. But her brother and her mother said, let the young women's woman stay with us a few days, say 10, and afterwards she may go. Now, was that part of the instructions? No. Eliezer was to find the bride and bring her, right? So to me, this is caution. A mother, a brother, family members, other voices can get in the way and cause you to think differently. But her brother and her mother said, wait a minute, let the young woman stay with us a few days and afterwards she may go. However, he said to them, this is Eliezer, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way Send me away so that I may get to my master. So he's got the goods and he wants to get back to his master. And they said, we will call the young woman and ask her. So they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men and they blessed Rebecca and said to her may you our sister become thousands of ten thousands and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them then Rebecca got up with her female attendants and they mounted the camels and followed the man so the servant took Rebecca and departed Laban and Rebecca's mother almost got in the way. But so to challenge her, Eliezer pops the question and says, will you follow me to my father's house to be with his son? Isn't that the question the Lord asks us every day? The Holy Spirit tugging at our hearts saying, will you follow my leading? Will you yield your spirit to me so that you can get to the Father's house and receive the glory of the Son? Yeah? I'm going to digress here because I have been thinking about, we use the term, the glory of the Lord. In a lot of our worship songs, we talk about the glory of the Son. What exactly is the glory? Raise your hand if you know. Not a single person. Mike? <laughs> I'm going to simplify a definition. But the glory can be defined as a feeling of dignity, of great value, of being accepted, of being legitimate. A feeling of dignity, of great value, of being accepted, and legitimacy. So y that can work both ways. When we're talking about the glory of the Son, He, Jesus, Jesus Christ, worthy of dignity, worthy of our acceptance. He is the one and only true God, the living Son of the one and true God. But if the glory of the Lord comes upon me, that is a feeling of that same dignity, of that same acceptance, of the same legiti legitimacy. I am not an orphan. I have been adopted. I belong to him. 
That's a heavy word. I want you to know the definition of it. We don't want to play around with the word glory, but we want to realize the glory of the Lord is upon us. It's pretty special. It's something to be good stewards of. So the question was asked, Rebecca, and her answer is awesome. She says, I will go. It's interesting that Rebecca's simple answer is, I will go. Because it's not enough just to say, yes, I accept Jesus. It's not enough to even accept the gifts of God. It's not enough to be adorned with the gifts and operate in them. The true challenge to the question that the father had asked the servant before he even left, see if she will be willing to follow. And she says, I will go. Did Jesus in his parting moments say, stay and be my disciples? No, he said, go and be my disciples. It takes faith. It takes the same faith that Abraham had when he stepped out of his homeland, not knowing where he would go to be the father of many nations. thinking about myself. <clears throat> it took faith for James and I to come up here not knowing what we were going to do, not knowing in advance that he'd be left, be, I'd be left here and he'd get to go home. That took faith. The bottom line is surrender and obedience. Are you going and telling the good news in your workplace? Are you going and telling the good news in your families? Are you going and telling the good news here? Here. Are you doing this? We need to press into the Holy Spirit for all that he has for us. If we don't do anything with what he has given us, we'll be no good to anyone. Faith without works is dead. Rebecca had not even seen Isaac, but yet her spirit bore witness because she was willing. Willing to serve even before she knew her place of service. And that she was the confirmation that she indeed was the bride. Rebecca said, I will go. She stood in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit pulled at her heart and asked her the question. And her response was, I will go. So my question for you is, will you go? Will you submit your spirit to the Holy Spirit of God so that others would see his confirming and gift, gifts operating in your life? 1 John 2.17 says, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Our eternal position in life depends if we will go. 